Our third talk is titled Dialectical Notes on the Human, Marxism as the Impossible and the Impossible Through a Marxist Lens. Please join me in welcoming Georgi Mamadov. Thank you and good morning. So yeah, I am that Marxist guy from the program. <laughs> that probably some of you were puzzled what I'm doing here. Uh, well, honestly, I was preparing an analytical argument uh, to shed the light on the potential connections between what we've been discussing here and the impossible and uh, Marxism. Um, and I think that still this um, analytical argument is valid and perhaps I will uh, deliver it sometime, somewhere. Uh, but I decided to opt for a more poetic and experiential answer to this question. So in a way, I would let the impossible speak through a Marxist mouth, uh, or maybe, yeah, let's put it like that. So. Um, so let me read something to you, which is um, sort of, yeah, autofictional or autobiographical piece, which is called, or oh, pardon my Latin, uh, A Diablo Cu Est Simia Dei, which I think loosely translates into English as where God has a church, the devil will have his chapel. My eyes are glued to a grayish hardcover in a second-hand bookshop. The title in brown letters reads, Latinsky Yazik. It's a Latin textbook for foreign language students. I'll feel almost a magic urge to have this book, to own it. I do not resist and buy it. It costs pennies anyways. I skim through the yellowed pages filled with the familiar font typical of Soviet-era books, and get a strange satisfaction from understanding random words in a language I never learned. Accusativus, activum, infinitivus, gerundium. I studied English and German in college, but we did not have a Latin class for some reason. I always felt bad about that, as if my knowledge was incomplete and defective. I felt that without the basic knowledge of Latin, I missed some foundation, continuity, and tradition. Tradition ties, tradition bounds, tradition bonds. I ask an Estonian comrade what it means to be a leftist in Estonia. She answers, it means being lonely, lonely. Why are we lonely? Lonely like a child that nobody wants to play with in a playground. What does the child do? They imagine. They imagine friends for themselves, imagined friends, superhero friends who will always stand by, who will play, who will laugh. I know this bitter feeling of loneliness of being left out, and a strong desire to compensate for that in one's imagination. All traumas <clears throat> originate in childhood. I was smoking on the outdoor terrace of my favorite pizza place in Bishkek. It was a short lunch break on a regular weekday. A couple passing by drew my attention. They looked odd, mismatched. A Kyrgyz man, my age or younger, average height and weight. He wore a backpack. Something in his look betrayed him as a provincial guy, not from Bishkek. <clears throat> she was a white woman, a foreigner, American or European. She gave me a strong queer vibe. Well, let me be honest, she was a towering fat dyke. What brings them together? 
I was almost ashamed of my presumptuous curiosity. Other colleagues in some international NGO, they look too casual for that. Is she a tourist and he's her guide or translator? Might be. They entered the cafe and I forgot about them. On my way out, I lit another cigarette on a terrace. My couple left the place a few moments later. Now there were four of them. A young Kyrgyz woman had joined them, and the dyke was carrying a boy, five or six year old. His eyes were all gray. They were not pupils. His legs were dangling, most likely cerebral palsy. The white lady was holding him gently. The man and the woman, who were an actual couple, helped her, helped her with the door. The woman carried a big bag. The mystery of misallied couple is solved. Like in a fast reel, I saw how in the morning the parents had chosen the best clothes for their son. It's an important day, and they must give the best impression possible. What if she says no? They had also put on their Sunday best. After all, going to the city is not a casual thing. I saw the dyke and her beloved femme wife going through numerous adoption catalogs during the calm, cozy evening in their ranch in Milwaukee. They saw his photo and looked in each other's eyes and simultaneously said, yes, that's the one. The dyke rushed to her phone and Googled the country she had never heard of before. Kyrgyzstan? Kyrgyzstan? Ah, Kyrgyzstan. They act out of love. The Kyrgyz parents want nothing but the best for their son, who was unlucky to be born in a country and culture which not only provides no support to people like him, but despises them. Over there, he will get all the care he needs and be free of the awful stigma. The sacrifice is worthy. The white lesbian couple will love him. They will call him Nick Nurbek. It's very important that he stays connected to his culture of origin, that he knows his roots. Maybe they will allow him to phone his birth parents sometime, and they for sure will return on holiday to this beautiful and hospitable country where the people are so nice and kind. The parents love Nurbek, the lesbians will love Nick Nurbek. Fuck this love, fuck them all. It's not silly at all to say I love you to someone you haven't spent much time with. In love, it's the intensity and not duration which defines time. You can spend months and years with people and still really know nothing about them because the, di because the time you share is loose or even empty. It's very true about many of our relationships, especially with those closest to us, like family. And with the one you love, time becomes thick and intense. Hours can matter more than months. The time I've known you has been very thick. Also, in life, time apart matters no less than time together. I had enough time to learn something about you and examine my feelings towards you. I love everything about you. And I know that you will never be an easy person to love. There is a lot going on inside you, but I want to embrace you just the way you are. Letter to A, May 2019, Bishkek. On a sunlit terrace of a coffee shop in Bishkek, Ahmad <clears throat> enthusiastically tells me about a small cultural center in Kabul where he and his friends host film screenings and poetry readings. On his mobile, he shows me the trailer of a film by a female Afghan director and shares his plans to start a film production studio after he completes his studies in Bishkek, where I happen to teach him an art history class in a film and media arts program. <clears throat> Ahmad persuades me to visit Kabul <clears throat> and is probably somewhat offended 
by my reluctance. He insists that it is safe, that Afghanistan is much more than the misery, violence, and suffering that the news media only bother to show. This conversation took place exactly a year ago, two years, in September 2020. A few days ago, Ahmad and I met for coffee again. He was lucky to catch one of the last commercial flights out of Kabul in August. We clinked our cups to him being safe and able to continue his studies, but neither my clumsy attempts to cheer him up nor the warmth of the afternoon sun amid the chill of an early fall breeze could disrupt the heaviness that hung around him. The cultural center he invited me to last year was closed by him and his friends as soon as the Taliban started advancing and capturing cities around the country. Quote, we did not want to wait for them to come and destroy everything we built. We destroyed it ourselves. End of quote. Ahmad recalls his last Skype conversation with his parents, who decided to stay in Kabul and adapt to the new circumstances. Quote, we lived through the Taliban's rule in the 1990s. We will live through it again. But we do not want you to ever come back here. We love you, but from now, but from now on, you are on your own. I asked if he recorded the call. He did not. We joked grimly about the lost opportunity for a dramatic art project that, would, that could have been developed out of that recording. September 2021, Bishkek. Prosidat ex amore and odium. There is just a step from love to hatred. Perhaps it is the solution. Hate what you have been told to love. I hope Nick Nurbeck hates his sweet mambians. I hope he hates his degenerate birth parents. I hope he grows full of hatred to his promised American dream. I hope he hates Kyrgyzstan. May out of this hatred, the new world be born. Hey, thy mother. Hey, thy motherland. Hey, thy father. Hey, thy fatherland. But does this work in reverse? Must we love what we have been told to hate? This would be a dialectical choice, much harder to make than the one above. It is easier to start hating what you used to love than to start loving what you used to hate. I once felt love towards Putin. It was short, momentous, but deep and intense, as true love usually is. I loved Putin with all my heart, and the tears started pouring from my eyes. So deep was my love for that little miserable motherfucker. <laughs> I, wanted to I wanted to embrace him to kiss him gently and whisper in his ear that I love him, that we all love him. It was Silas Sibin, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Who on earth would feel that when sober? <laughs> but was it just delusional? Didn't it reveal some truest truths about the world, one that we are not ready to accept? Imagine all the people loving Putin with their hearts. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Well, that's for sure. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. I can easily hate what is seemingly lovable. I hated Amsterdam, I remember. 
all those relaxed, gentle people. <laughs> bestowing upon you, they asked for why to the smiles. All those little, tiny, tidy houses along the canals. All that unshiny yet solid wells, stolen wells, accumulated for centuries. The foundation, the solid base for a casual smile. A smile is a luxury. In Bishkek, strangers rarely exchange smiles. Probably never. I feel like an angry barbarian, an uninvited guest at this feast of life. Perhaps it's just envy. You are jealous of the solidness and solidity of their socially secured life. No wonder you envy that. You never learned Latin, did you? We want to wave our lives, and not just lives, the entire world into a solid, seamless canvas. My grandma loves to say, Где тонко, там рвется. It breaks where it's thin. In these breaks, ruptures, wrecked holes, the logic of the world, order, falls apart, and we get a chance to see what that solid compound is made of. Benjamin called it a dialectical image. Right after Benjamin turned 40, he went to Nice, where we, he went to Nice with the aim to, of ending his life. In the dark, stuffy room of a cheap boarding house, he wrote a will and a few letters to friends and the exes. He did not die that night. Writing helps, I assume. This is what a shrink would say. Write out your pains. You'll feel relief. I write. Wherever I go, there is a shadow of you. I climb the Suleiman's mountain, and looking through the mist at the city with never healing wounds, I was thinking of you. I watered the tips of my beaten boots in the waves of the hot lake, and the sand and the breeze and the blue filled me with the sweetest thoughts of you. I entered the wooden church which was full of beautiful plants. And while lighting the candles to my namesake saint, I was thinking of you. In the meditative silence of the medieval Nestorian monastery, following the shadow of a solemnly flying falcon, I was thinking of you. In the empty mosque after Juma, I saw a boy protruding his feet bath in a prayer. What a beautiful boy. I could not take my eyes off him, but his beauty made me think of you even more. November 2019, Bishkek. I have been thinking of George Gross a lot lately. He continuously spiraled between love and hatred all his life. He hated Germany and everything German in the 1920s so much that he even anglified his name, originally Georg Gross. Germany paid him back in full, three blasphemy charges, regular death threats. He hoped that after the years of hatred in Germany, he could finally turn to love in the United States. <coughs> that did not happen. Instead, he realized that he was too German, even Gothic in his blood, and the American glossy life did not fit his Nordic origins. He started loving what he used to hate his Germanness. From a fierce communist in the early 1920s, he grew into a sinister masker of the hypocrisy, hypo, hypocrisy of the Bolshevik leaders from Lenin to Trotsky and Lunacharsky, all of whom he happened to meet during his short trip to Soviet Russia. He started hating what he used to love. What a dialectical life. He returned to Berlin in 1959, denouncing his American dream as a soap bubble. A few weeks later, after a night of drinking, he slept on the staircase of his apartment and died unconscious the same day. In Vina Veritas. Do we all have an American dream? Defending his 
carrying out of the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. In a casual interaction with reporters after 9-11 memorial event at the Shanksville Volunteer Fire Department in Pennsylvania, Joe Biden made a revelatory remark that went almost unnoticed by the major media outlets in the U.S. For example, quote, for example, if we were in Tajikistan and we pulled up with a C-130 and say, we are going to let, you know, anybody who was involved with being sympathetic to us to get on the plane, you'd have people hanging on the wheel as well. Come on. Well, I bet Biden nailed it. I was born in Tajikistan and lived there through the bloody civil war triggered by the dissolution of the USSR in the 1990s. I am one of those sympathetic to the US from Biden's mumblings. Throughout my student years, I was a beneficiary of multiple educational programs, grants, and exchange trips funded by the US government and philanthropists. Even my career as a leftist intellectual and my radical queer activism have been wholly dependent on foreign grants that supposedly promote democracy and human rights. Watching in the news people storming Kabul airport, desperately clinging to the wheel of an airplane as it was taking off and eventually falling from the sky, I was thinking how long it would take until I and many of my friends and comrades would find ourselves in similar circumstances. And it is not an emotionally manipulative stretch. The biggest crimes of American imperialism are not those committed through boots on the ground. Those are just the most obvious ones. The biggest imperialist felony is the monopolization of the very concepts of liberation, democracy, and human rights. Nobody asks one to be sympathetic to America for the sake of America or its dusty American dream. What is being traded for that sympathy is the very desire to live a decent life, to be able to, let's say, create and watch films, to study and understand the world, and to take control of your own bodies and lives. And Afghanistan was not the only place in the world where many of these things were and are contingent on foreign aid. With all the heartbreaking imagery of desperation and suffering we saw in the news, and even more, than we, in, even more that will remain unseen by the world, Afghanistan is not unique. And what is happening there right now is not an excess. What we see in Afghanistan is just a condensed example of the state of things around the world. Illusionary islands of democracy and freedom, sustained by imperialist monetary and military interventions in the sea of disillusioned, impoverished and deprived masses, finding their only hope and refuge in the most reactionary ideologies. September 2021, Bishkek, from an unpublished op-ed op -ed commissioned by an American leftist magazine. I hate you all, and there is no one to love. Quote, if I wanted to be nice to everyone I don't sleep with, I'd have a lot to do. So I'm nice to the, to the ones I sleep with. That's politics. Ronald M. Chernikow. If I wanted to be nice to everyone I sleep with, I'd have a lot to do. I am not even close to Chernikow. My politics and my desires never match. I am more like Kolontai. She is a hero. She is an icon. Champion of free love. Great revolutionary Sasha Kalantai shot at her man, revolutionary sailor Debenka. No matter how hard she tried to love like a communist, it didn't turn out very well. I want to love like a communist too. When a person is not a means, but the goal, when there is no anxiety and drug addiction, at which each meeting is replaced by hangover, brittle, desire for a new dose, human dose, we are consumers of people, and replacement therapy doesn't help us anymore. You are my heaviest drug, even though you weigh only 50 kilos. I lift you up with ease, you wrap your legs around me, and we spin in a ridiculous dance by the crumpled bed. I don't want to consume you. I don't want to consume anyone. I don't want to shoot you. I don't want to shoot myself. I just hope 
communism coming soon. And everything will be different. Well, except the crumpled bat. August 29, sorry, August yeah, 2019, Bishkek, Google translation from Russian. Quote, if you are not a socialist at 20, you've got no heart. If you are still one at 40, you've got no hat. <laughs> I'm 38. <laughs> and I'm anticipating my 40s with fear. What if, what if I fall into this stereotypical trope? What if I betray my principles? What if I suddenly fall, fall in love with the tiny streets and cozy houses of Amsterdam? What if I fall in love with Putin without any dumb and psychedelics? One must remain solid in one's hatred. <laughs>